So uh, we've got today and next week, and we're going to be done our sermon on Ephesians. So what you can do is take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, in, we're going to be going through a bird's eye view of the whole chapter. And uh, don't worry, the sermon's only going to be 68 minutes today. <laughs> and you're all like, please, Bob, no. Say it's not true. It's okay. Don't worry. It's not going to be that long. Um, but what we're going to do is instead of reading the whole passage, we're going to read it in bits as we go through the message. So um, today's sermon is called, uh, We Are Who We Imitate. And that's really true about human beings. You really do end up imitating um, somebody or someone that taught you how to be a human being or a hero. So you've got this picture of these kids. At some point, we all imitate someone we admire, someone we look up to, Right? Even if they're not admirable people, we end up imitating them. And uh, you'll see boys imitating their hero. So they might imitate Captain America or Superman. Hopefully they don't jump off things with capes, but just the couch. Or they imitate anti-heroes, anti-heroes like Deadpool. They try and be like him. They try and be a wisecracking. And I've seen kids do this wisecracking, swear their head off kind of fool instead of being a true hero like Captain America, for instance. But these things are caught more than they're taught. So who you hang out with rubs off on you. You just catch their character. It's just the way it is. Stories um, can inspire character too. So Aslan, the lion from the Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe, has been my hero since 1975, since my dad started reading us the, the Chronicles of Narnia. I wanted to be like Aslan. That kind of hero gets into your DNA. So when a kid watches someone with bad morals, that gets into their DNA as a person. When someone watches um, a good hero and hangs out with a good person, that rubs off on them as well. And what Paul is saying here in verses 1 and 2 is, imitate God in everything you do because you're his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. The best modeling of character comes through relationship with good people that love Jesus and they're like him, so you want to be like him. And Paul said, you know, when I, got, when I get it right, follow me. When I get it wrong, I ask you for your forgiveness. Don't take your eyes off of Jesus. The character of Jesus will rub off on you if you spend time with godly people and you spend time in his word, you spend time getting songs like that one we just watched into your bloodstream that Jesus will not abandon you. He's faithful, so you want to be faithful to your friends. He's forgiven you, so you want to be forgiven. You want to be a forgiver, right? When we're in a relationship with people like that and we study his word, and it's not just academic. There's some people that study the word of God like a textbook and they just, the heart never gets it. It just sticks stuck in their head. And they love theology and eschatology and all those tologies, but they don't get loveology, right? It never translates. And what Paul's saying in verse 1 and 2 is, you got to live a life like his. That means a life of love, the character of Christ, following his example. The Bible says that Jesus went about doing good. He healed the sick. He defended the accused. He forgave mistakes and sins and blunders. He laughed. He cried. He was a human being, showed us how to be the best human being. He was God with skin on, so he never made a mistake. He just showed us how to love and to live. He showed us what real love was when he died on the cross for us. 1 John 3.16 says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and now we get to live, lay down our life for other people. That's what we strive for. But it means laying down our pride. Because um, imitate God affects everything. Right down at the end of the chapter, it affects your marriage. It affects your children. Imitate God affects your work. It affects your friendships. It affects everything in your life when you imitate him. You lay down your pride, you be like Jesus. If you lay down your pride, there's no clamoring for spotlight. i got to get my name in bigger print than that other person on the, on the play bulletin. There'd be no vying for position, no jealousy on our part because he just did his part and he's just asking you to play your part. Just be yourself and walk with him. Be like him and you'll change the world. And then Paul says in verse 3, imitate him in your walk. So, in a world of sexual impurity, you be someone who's sexually pure. Don't let impurity or greed be among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. If we're imitating him, we imitate him in the way we walk, the way we live our, 
our life. Think about this, men. Jesus was fully God and fully man. You know what that means, fellas? He was a red-blooded male and would have thought, like you do, that pretty women are pretty. Some people cringe when you... No, no, he was fully God, fully man. So it's not a sin to be attracted to a beautiful woman. Jesus showed us how to be a man, to be pure. He remained celibate, but he was friends with women, and there was never a hint of sexual immorality. He controlled his thoughts, which lead to impurity, right? Because this can be a, um, a haven from the world or a petri dish. Jesus showed us how to live your life starting here and here and living it out. He was not greedy. He was generous. So imitate Jesus. Verse 4, imitate God in your talk, your walk and in your talk, right? Obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes, these are not for you any longer. Let your speech in your life reflect the character of God. So your words reflect your faith. Jesus invented humor, okay? He created the world, so he invented humor. He invented clownfish, smiling dolphins. He invented jokes. It all came from him because we come from him. But he never told an unclean joke. He didn't have obscene humor, but he was a funny person. His, his speech sometimes was, um, was truthfully sharp but never he spoke in revenge. Peter, who hung out with him for three years, says whenever Jesus was put down or reviled, as the King James says, he reviled not again. In, in our words, in verse 23, he did not retaliate when he was insulted or threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God. So Jesus' talk and speech were never a means for revenge like we do. So we've got to pray that God changes our heart because from your heart you speak. He, he did always speak the truth, but he spoke it in love. He spoke it properly and in perfect timing. Sometimes my timing and my words is way off and I need to shut up, right? I see my wife sometimes when I was trying to talk to one of her daughters about a situation and she would be like, <laughs> like the timing's not good, Bob. Okay, gotcha. But you see what happens in 2019, okay guys? Um, we are looking for an excuse to get the that's been building up in us because we use our words as weapons and people will use any excuse they can on Twitter or Facebook or verbally for put downs and there's venting the anger because it's been building up. But imitating Jesus means you forgive, you let it go instead of letting it stew in the cauldron of anger and contempt, right? He used his words instead to pray for people and you saw that from the cross. The skeptics of Christianity can't argue with the Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The people hurling insults at Jesus. The people beating him, spitting on him. Father, forgive them. He used his words to pray for people. So use your words to pray for people. Okay? And verses 5 and 6. Remember that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person, it's a worshiper. It's an idol of greed and money, worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse their sin. For the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. This is a good reminder for us today not to get caught up in the way of doing things like the world is doing them. People have all kinds of excuses. You know, I have an excuse for acting this way. I have an excuse for doing this. I have an excuse for talking like this. I have an excuse for being like this. If you're going to be stuck in your hatred and your mire and your lust and your pride and your greed, that's, there's no excuse. You may rally people around you who will be your buddy and stand with you in your sin so you feel better about what you're doing, but you're not fooling God. You know what to do and what not to do. It's in your nature, God's nature. The image of God knows, you know when you're being wrong. But today, humility and maturity are lacking in our culture. Today's society, nobody humbles themselves before God and says, I'm going to grow up now. I'm going to be like Jesus in a world stuck at an immature stage of disobeying your father like little children so you can be selfish. Paul's reminding us that if we continue in sin and immaturity, there's going to be a price to pay. You, not Jesus, will end up paying the price of your sin. So let it, let it fall at the cross. Grow up in Christ. Romans 1 tells us nobody on earth will have an excuse when he comes back. So we need to change Jesus said, repent, that means rethink your life. 
And then verses 7 to 12 says, Don't participate in the things that people of the world do. You were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord, so live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Those are good words. So think about what you're doing. Rethink your life. There's a great series on YouTube right now on Rick Warren's channel called Rethink Your Life. We got to rethink how to live the human life. So carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Don't just go on instinct because you can't trust your heart. You can trust the Word of God. You can trust how Jesus lived. You can ask Him how to live. But don't just go with your gut because the heart is deceitful, more wicked than I can know. I can't trust myself. I've got to carefully determine what would please Jesus. Um, live like people of light. You guys saw Colby speak on September 22nd. He's our friend who's starting a new church in Kelowna, and his church is called Live Free Church. That's a great name for a church because the church is supposed to live free from the old life and the shackles and, and the bitterness and the rage and the greed and the lust. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Rethink your life. Paul says a society that's getting to a place like Ephesus where he's writing to, and our society today is getting darker. Don't dwell in the darkness. Don't talk about it too much. Paul says there's some things you should not even talk about in this chapter. He says there's some things people do. Don't even talk about it with your kids. Avoid the subject because pe that person maybe has gotten so dark that you don't want to darken the atmosphere of your dinner table by talking about it. Concentrate on the light. My dad would watch TV with us, and he would say things during the show out loud or during commercials, and things like this. That is stupid. We'd be like, okay, dad, we're watching the show. And he'd say, I'll tell you why. And you couldn't pause it back then, right? We'd be like, okay, here comes my dad telling us why it's wrong. Or he'd say, that is wrong. And we'd be like, okay, right? And, but he was right. It was wrong what we were watching. He was correcting us. So he was using it as an example, right? If it got too wrong, he'd say, that's enough. <laughs> Shut it off, right? He didn't want to open a sewer pipe into our living room. He, he would say things during commercials like, that is a lie. We'd be like, okay, Dad. But he was right. That was a lie. Your three-year-old car in the driveway does not need to be replaced with a 2020. Don't strap yourself with having the latest and greatest. That's greed. Paul says, leave it alone. You don't need to keep up with the Joneses, right? My dad would got to the point where he would just turn down commercials and talk to us and then turn it back up for the show because he was so sick of the brainwashing of the media, right? But he didn't put us in a box and not let us live in the world. He coached us. Um, verses 13 and 14 say, On the day Jesus comes back, evil intentions will be exposed when the light of God shines on them. The light makes everything visible. So um, God knows your heart. He knows when you're trying to point toward Jesus to be like him, to grow as a person, to grow as a parent, to grow as a husband, to grow as a wife. He understands your heart. But he knows when somebody's trying to be sneaky. And they may fool everybody around them, but we're not fooling him. Some people can come to church their whole life and look like a good Christian. And when the, when the Lord comes back, he'll say, you were just doing that for your pride. And that's what Ben talked about last week. Sometimes we do things. So we look good. And he's saying, don't. Your intentions, there's no more hiding. No skulking around in the dark. And Paul says, guys, we need to wake up. He says, wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead. Leave your past behind. Christ will give you light. And this is what happens. We get lulled to sleep by society. We get lulled to sleep by the media. We get lulled to sleep by TV shows that tell us their worldview. Don't allow yourself to be in a self-induced coma. People who live in rebellion to God and, and indulge themselves, you're in self-indulgence. What you do is you self-induce a coma and you can't hear God anymore. And you fill, they fill their minds with just the garbage of this cultural moment, which will change guys. This, this cultural moment and what they believe is true is going to change. The Word of God won't. It's your rock. Follow that, because this is going to fade away. Everything that they say is great and glorious, and all, all their, all their um, bragging and their pride and the, the covetousness of our generation where the materialism, it's going to fade. So... Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, wake up. At Bible school one night, we, I was the RA, the resident assistant. I had eight boys under my 
care that were younger than me and I, I had to just be there for them. And we had 3 a.m. fire alarm. My job when I heard that, didn't know what was gonna happen, was to get up, go wake up all my boys and get them outside. You didn't know if it was a fake fire or not, right? I run into John's room and John was one of those sleepers that is like out, right? And I'm shaking him. John, get up. And he's just like, and I'm like, he's drooling on his pillow. And I'm like, get up, get up, get up. I'm like, Kurt, come help me. And we're like, get up, John, get out. And he's just like, and I'm like, if we found out it wasn't a real fire, we would have rolled him out of bed and knocked him on his head to wake him up. But he just wouldn't wake up. And Paul's saying, we need to be alert. We need to wake up because there might not be much time. You can't waste the amount of time you've got left. I'm only 51, but I tell you, those 51 years went like that. And I don't know if I've got five or 10 or five months. I don't know. I've got to make the most of my life. And imitate Jesus' use of time. Paul says, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't waste your time being drunk because that will ruin your life. That's one thing he's talking about. But you know, when I got daughters that all four of them got to work at Askew's and they say, you know, there's $1,200 of groceries going out for a houseboat trip and $2,000 in liquor and people finish their trip and they come into the store. How was your trip? I don't know. I don't remember it. Right? It's like, wow, that was a lot of money for something you don't remember. Right? You guys got to use your time wisely. My four girls are out of the house now. They were little when I moved here 11 years ago. Buy some family board games. Yes, watch a movie together, but don't watch five hours of TV together. Watch one show and play a board game. It'll, it'll be an investment in your family. Go on a walk with them. Take them for coffee one-on-one. -on -one. Invest time. It's the only thing they're not making any more of. Christ is giving you an opportunity every day. Don't waste it. My biggest regrets in life are when I remember I had a chance to do something, I didn't do it, and the opportunity was gone. I know I'm forgiven, but the worst thing is knowing I could have made a difference. People waste their memory making time with friends and family. Sometimes they waste it by being drunk. They can't remember what they did. Make a memory you'll remember. Go have one beer and then have a good time, but remember your time. Invest. Create memories that will last. Use your time wisely. What if one day your neighbor just is gone and you never ever talk to them, show them the love of God, and they moved away, and you're the only Christian, and this is serious when I say this, that you ever knew, they ever knew their whole life. What if you're the only person that's praying for that person? You're the only person on the planet praying for that person, and you don't do it. Use your time. Think about your life. Make it count. And then verses 18 to 20, he says, so instead of being drunk with wine, because it'll ruin your life, instead be filled with God's Spirit. Let Him control you, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs among yourselves. Make music to the Lord in your heart. Give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is pretty straightforward. I told you guys again and again and again, get a good playlist. The next slide's got, um, we're, we're putting an SEC playlist on Spotify of worship songs to fill your faith engines up. Get it. Go to the World Index of Sermons on YouTube. Listen to Billy Graham. Go to Gospel and Life on YouTube. Listen to Tim Keller. Get the Sermon of the App Day or the Gospel and Life app. Use your time driving to fill up on God's hope. GPS, God, People, Stories by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Get Change Life Stories. Put those on your phone. Fill yourself up with the Spirit of God. And then the last point Paul makes in this chapter is this. Imitate him in your family. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Imitate God means live a life of love, means live like Jesus. And what did Jesus do when he was here? The King of Heaven submitted himself to be born in a barn at Christmas. The King of Heaven set aside his throne to live life as a humble carpenter, to help his family, to show us what being a um, blue-collar guy was like. The king of heaven set aside privilege, set a riding in Jerusalem on a big white horse and conquering with one word. He came in on a donkey at eye level with everybody. He submitted himself to us 
and let us kill him so that we could be saved. And this is how to live a family life. He says, wives, this means you submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, wives submit to your husbands and everything. For husbands, this means you submit to your wives in love. The way Jesus did. You give up all your luxury, all the things that you could have. And don't be like the guy who was sitting behind in traffic with the license plate holder that said, my wife got the kids, I got the Hemi. That guy obviously didn't get it, right? No wonder the marriage fell apart. For years, people have used this passage to put women in their places. This is not what is going on here. The, what's going on is that we love Jesus. Yes, we're the church. We submit to him. He's our hero, our savior. We're his bride. One day there's going to be a joyous wedding day. The church and Jesus coming together and never being apart again. We respect him. We listen to him. We let him do his job of providing for us. And you know what? I've never seen a wife have a hard time being a wife to a guy that's godly. A godly man who submits his whole life to her and his children to provide for them and be a good example. That marriage works. That's what we're striving for. The next slide's got what it's all about. It's about mutual submission. Jesus is called the groom. We're the bride of Christ, the church. We submit to him. He, submits his, he submitted his needs to us on this earth, set aside his pride, became a slave, died for us. That's what we're talking about. This is how to have a good life. The next slide says, imitate God. That means when we're in our home, we imitate Jesus and what kind of husband is Jesus? Not what kind of husband would he be? He's a, a husband to us. And he provides for us. He never holds anything against us. He's our defender, our hero. And guys, if you will be the hero to your family, you will be investing your life wisely. You can be your wife's hero. You can be your kid's hero. You can be a slave to them. That means when you're tired, you get up and you do the dishes. You sweep the floor. You do what needs to be done around the house. You invest it in your kids, and it turns out that your kids then will see Jesus in you, and they will want to serve like he does, because it's caught, not just taught. And so that's what this is all about, is imitating him in your marriage. And get this, it's to your benefit. Paul spends way more time on the guys than the girls, okay? He said in the next verse of 27, 29, Jesus did this to present the church, her, to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Instead, she'll be holy without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For that man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds for it and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. Guys, you will make your wife radiant when you sacrifice for her like Christ. You will help her to grow to be more like Jesus as you model him for her and the kids. Wives, you model strong, steel-like womanhood. I only, know, I only have a frame of reference for two women in my life. They're both Sandras. They call my wife Sandy and my wife Sandra. I watch my mom submit often her whole life to the needs of the church. To love the people, to feed them roast beef every Sunday after church. To work hard to see your husband go out and, and use his day off to help the church. She submitted herself to that. I saw my wife submit herself to her husband's desire to plant a church 11 years ago. And every Sunday night she was teaching Sunday school and having people over for nachos. She was submitting herself to the mission. And she was like, she was like steel. Because you end up showing yourself to your kids and they will end up serving Jesus the same way. And it's about de-stressing your life, guys. You will de-stress your life. And you'll have happy wife, happy what? Happy wife, happy... I can't hear you. <laughs> happy wife, happy... Thank you, fellas. Greater intimacy. I tell young fellows at the altar, sweep the floor, better sex. And they're like, it's the truth. Good memories you will build 
I sound like Yoda there, didn't I? <laughs> hmm? Good memories you will build. Um, and kids, and get this, kids that want to take care of you when you're old and have time for you when you're old because you had time for them when they needed you. That's the benefit you're investing in your whole life. So church, study this chapter. Don't choke on your pride. Don't let a passage like this that is meant to build up the house and the world, because you will show the world what a family of God looks like and others will get brought in that family. Imitate Him. Make Him your model in life. Make Jesus your obsession. Make Him your hero. If you have a pen, write down Philippians chapter 2. Reread that about Jesus. But let's be like Him. Imitate God. And then we um, will have a happy life. It may not be perfect, but who we are is who we imitate. Let's pray. I'll call the band up while we're all praying. Lord, I pray that you could cut out of our hearts the pride that stops us from serving each other. I pray that you would cut out the um, part of our brain that says, don't be a slave. Instead, we'd be a slave to love. I pray you give us wisdom to discern when we need to stick up for ourselves, to know when to draw lines, to know when to stand up and say, this is not the way it's going to be. Give our, our youth, women, our young women, power to pick godly men and to be strong and to stand up for what's right. Give our boys hearts to be a godly husband one day. I pray that we would set an example for those around us and our kids. I pray that, Jesus, you could change our minds where they need to be changed and help us to be like you, to be a hero who gave his life so that we can see the people around us saved. We come to you now and ask you to be our rock that we stand on now as we go throughout the week. Help us to be standing on you and your character and the way you do things. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we stand up and sing Cornerstone?